helped along mostly by my parents more than anything else. And uh, when I got into law school, I really didn't like it. I was in New Haven. I didn't care for city life. And I didn't like all the gargoyles and stuff around there. So I was not happy there. And uh, in the second year, which would have been uh, early in 68, during the Tet Offensive, I remember sitting there after dinner watching the news, as many of us did, and it was full of the Tet Offensive going on there. So, you know, we were watching Marines doing something or another. I remember thinking to myself, you know, for two cents I'd quit this place and join the Marine Corps. And it was like a light bulb going on. Suddenly I realized, hey, I can do that, you know. So I did, much to my parents' unhappiness. But uh, uh, the next day I went up. Well, first I went to see the recruiter down in New Haven, and he said, well, you have to go to Hartford for the officer program. So I, that afternoon I went up there, probably cut a couple classes, and uh, <clears throat> on the, the, another day or two I went back for a second meeting with him, signed the papers, and that was it. I finished up my second year, and um, that October report, I think it was October 14th, uh, 1968 reported for active duty for training at Quantico and that's how I enlisted <laughs> and you did your you went through OCS at Quantico yeah OCS at Quantico I had to actually do it twice because it's, it was a 10-week program there and in the eighth week of my first time through I got a stress stress fracture of a toe on my right foot and you know couldn't run or anything had to hobble around so they did what was known as recycling me they put me in the uh, casual platoon to recover from that and then afterwards I because I was marginal physically you know I really struggled to get through that I was never any athlete or anything I never did anything that strenuous in my whole life and I guess my toe just couldn't take it but uh, <clears throat> so I went into the physical training platoon, the PT platoon. And, oh boy, you know, that was two hours every morning, two hours every afternoon without fail, sometimes longer. And so that stretched out. Then I went through a second program from the beginning. So I actually got my commission April 18th, 69. Okay. You were commissioned a second lieutenant. Right. And then what did you do? Well, then I went to the basic school, which was 21 weeks. Uh, OCS is more or less just designed to see if you can take it and get you into condition. And then you, you, if you are past that, you're commissioned, and then you do your real basic training as a second lieutenant. So uh, it's a little bit different, I know, than what the Army and some of the other services do. So after 21 weeks, past that, went home for a month, and then I went to, I had selected tanks as my... MOS, and uh, that's a tank school was at Camp Pendleton. So I went out there for I think that was a six week training course, and from there headed right over to Westpac and on the first tank battalion at, with the first division in Vietnam. Where, where were you stationed in Vietnam? Uh, with the tanks, well, the, the battalion was located at division headquarters. And I think that was Hill 55, if I remember. All of the places were on hills there because it was all rice paddies. So, you know, and they all were known as Hill 55, 65, whatever the height might have been. But, uh, but they, my particular platoon was located at, uh, the, we called it Sea Anchor, but it was just, just immediately south of Marble Mountain. You drove around some dirt road that went around a mountain. You went through a little village, and we were right on the shore, which is why they call it Sea Anchor. <clears throat> and I also had half my platoon at a place called Anwa, which I believe was about 60 miles south of Da Nang. It was a better part of a day's haul to, you know, get from one place to the other. By? By whatever. I mean, you either went by Jeep or... Oh. You know, you'd have to sometimes, or a helicopter, sometimes they had a service. I'd have to go to the Marine Corps or to the uh, division headquarters and catch a helicopter flight down there. I didn't like flying in helicopters. That's one of the reasons I picked tanks. Helicopters can't pick those up. <laughs> How do you spell 
It was A-N and then a separate word, H-O-A. It was the, it had the remains of some kind of a factory that they'd only put up the steel for it when the war started. And I remember it just as a sea of mud, literally. I mean, they had a parking area outside. They had inside vehicles and outside vehicles because the mud was so soupy, it, it tore the brakes and transmissions to all the pieces. So if you came in with an outside Jeep, you had to park it in an outer area, and then they had an inside Jeep come up to pick you up because you couldn't walk through that stuff. And the, we, the guys who were, had the tanks there were particularly unhappy because if they broke a torsion bar or a tread or anything you know, outside the tank, basically you know they had to die you know dive under the tank in this terrible mud uh you know to to do the work on it so as an officer of course i didn't actually do work but i felt obliged to get in the mud and stomp around with them i didn't like it either <laughs> well, uh, when did you arrive in vietnam oh let's see i got to vietnam I'm not sure the actual date it was probably like the 23rd maybe 24th of December just before Christmas because I remember everybody there was celebrating you know Christmas and I was feeling kind of depressed <laughs> having just gotten there and not having adjusted to it and all and, uh, we were located near the uh, artillery base there so and I hadn't figured out the difference between incoming and outgoing at that point so Every time there was an explosion, you know, I looked for a hole to jump into. <coughs> so that was 1223, 69? 69, right. Okay. All right. And what, why don't you describe your duties? Uh, well, I was a tank officer, so, uh, you know, first I went to the tank battalion headquarters, and they had like a week-long, you know, uh, indoctrination there. Uh, procedures and whatever and then I was assigned to a tank platoon which was located at either Marble Mountain or uh, An Hua and I don't remember where I went first but I went out to one and I had a gunnery sergeant who was the second in command and he had the, whichever two tanks I didn't have we would swap like every two weeks or so um, but uh, you know I was annoyed because I was looking for action and wherever I went, nothing ever happened. Wherever the, the gunny was with the other half of the platoon, you know, their base got attacked or whatever. So, you know, I'd promptly switch, and then the other one would be attacked. But the guys all liked it because they, you know, they were very superstitious over there. <clears throat> they promptly decided I was good luck. So both, both halves of the platoon, oh, why don't you stay with us another week, Lieutenant? You know, no, I, I need to get over to the other half there. You know, we'll send the gunny back, you know. Remember the gunny sergeant's name? Um, his last name was Hanson, H-A-N-S-E-N, -E and he was a, a terrific guy because really when you come in there as a second lieutenant, you know, you might outrank him, but he'd been in the Marine Corps for over 20 years and he knew his stuff. He was a tanker from day one. So, I mean, you know, that's really from him. I mean, and he was gracious about it. Well, Lieutenant, you know, I'd suggest that you know, we do this. Oh, uh, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, that's my order. We'll do that. You know, but, you know, he, he really helped me learn a lot about it. <clears throat> he left me. That, well, he got reassigned, better assignment. I think he went back to battalion headquarters or whatever. And they sent me another guy who was an alcoholic. I don't remember his name, but the first night, it was a day in a the first night he was there, you know, I came back from the old club or wherever I'd been, <clears throat> and he was just about passed out. So I said, well, it's his first night out here. Nerves, I guess, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> Next night, he did the same thing. So the third night, I said, I think I'll make some changes around here. So, you know, I pretended to go out, but I came back half an hour later. He had a whole suitcase full of Jack Daniels bottles. So he was just opening it up. I said, you break the seal on that bottle. And I said, tomorrow morning you pack everything up, go back to division, to, to battalion headquarters, and tell them I don't want you because you're an alcoholic. Oh, he was terribly offended by that. I'm not an alcoholic, you know. I can take it or leave it. And I said, good, then leave it for the rest of the time you're here. 
So he pretty much did. Because, I mean, he, again, had, you know, maybe 18, some years. He wasn't quite ready for retirement, as I recall. And, you know, if I had sent him back, that would have been the end of his his Marine Corps career. They would not have allowed him to re-enlist. So, but it was unfortunate. But now, who did you report to? I reported, my company commander was a first lieutenant, and I do not remember his name now. But he was a Mustanger. You know, he'd been enlisted for a number of years and then had gotten a temporary commission. Okay. I, I ran into some of those guys later on when, you know, when I was back at headquarters Marine Corps. And by that time, the war was winding down and they got reverted back. Uh, not in this, Usually not to the rank they'd been, but because they got promoted automatically in the enlisted ranks while they were in, in temporary commission. So, you know, they were usually like master sergeants or gunnery sergeants by that time, but every one of them was thoroughly disgruntled, having been an officer, and you know. But that was the deal that they made. And when they got to thirty years, <clears throat> whether they retired at twenty or, but when they got to thirty years, they would have reverted to the highest rank held, and it would have been a big increase in their retirement pay. So, you know, they all stuck it out for that reason. But you know. Wasn't a good morale booster doing that. Why don't you um, briefly describe what a typical day would be like? Uh, you know, I don't really remember. At Sea Anchor, we were posted. They had an outpost that we called it the Leprosarium because it had been a Leprosarium uh, before the war. And they had an outpost that I think was like maybe 10 miles down the beach from there so we were posted out there with two tanks and they generally just used us on perimeter duty at night you know because we did produce a lot of firepower if necessary uh, a few times they had operations but you know the train around there was treacherous because tanks you know, are heavy and they sink pretty easy if they, you get soft ground so but i know we went out on a few operations to provide you know a mobile artillery platform so to speak <coughs> for them uh, at Anwa we used we were on perimeter duty at night there too and during the, in the morning they would do a road sweep and they always sent two of the tanks out with the road sweep I found out later on sometimes the engineers <coughs> didn't have batteries for their their uh, metal detectors so they put the tank out there first figuring well if there's a booby trap there that'll set it off and they'd be walking along behind with a non-functioning mine uh, battle or a uh, metal detector. Were you involved in any um, in major battles? No, you know, as I say, you know, I was highly annoyed at the time. But wherever I went, peace generally reigned. And the whole time I was over there, only one time did I really get involved in what I would call action, and, and we got mortared one night uh, at Sea Anchor, and that was after I'd left tanks and was, a, you know, serving as an infantry officer. And they had suspected something was going to happen, some kind of intelligence, so <clears throat> we were all out of the hooches and sleeping in holes in the ground, and I was at a, I had command of a section of the beach there, and all of a sudden mortars started raining down, and we were in an open, there were like four of us in an open, foxhole and you know everybody's pressing themselves against the the wall or whatever trying to get down low and you know it occurred to me hey if one of those things lands in here you know it doesn't matter where you are so I, like, I don't know what you guys are doing but you know if a mortar round comes in we've all had it anyway so we yeah you're right so we all stood up I mean the hole was deep enough our heads were protected there they had sandbags around there and we're all standing there with our hands in our pockets you know looking up in the air wondering if we were going to get hit by a mortar one landed about 20 yards away that was, was the closest one it blew sand stones and stuff all over us but uh, that was it that lasted probably five minutes if that seemed like a long time but that was about the only thing that you know uh, how did you feel when you first got there uh, when you, when you arrived, did you arrive in Denang? Yeah, they, we flew over by a commercial charter, uh, some kind of a jet passenger plane. 
And, you know, of course, we'd been on Okinawa for like a week or something. Um, and Okinawa was fairly civilized, you know, the nice base and all. And we landed at Da Nang Airport, and, you know, we were all joking, should we go out form a perimeter? Of course, we were unarmed or anything. But the uh, funny story about that, too, the guy who was my seatmate was, uh, he, he wasn't military, he was in the Naval Investigative Service. He was a civilian, but he, he was like a police officer. He was armed with a pistol. So, you know, nothing happened for a while. We were waiting for people from our units to come pick us up. So he and I had found a spot in the shade and had thrown our gear down and we're sitting there leaning back and some enlisted guy, you know, like a corporal or Lance Corporal comes walking by. And, hey, he says, you two guys want any marijuana? <laughs> so I looked at the NIS guy <clears throat> and he just smiled and he said, why don't you tell him what your rank is? And I said to him, I'm a lieutenant. Oh, well, excuse me, lieutenant, you know. And I said, he's from the Naval Investigative Service. And boy, that guy disappeared, <laughs> leaving little puffs of smoke where his feet touched the ground. <coughs> so I guess he learned, you know, check things out before you talk to strangers. But I guess the guy from NIS figured, hey, I'm not going to start work yet. So <laughs> he let it go. Explain for a record that I'm just getting over a cold. It seems to have settled in my voice here for today, but uh, so I'm just taking little sips of water to keep going. <clears throat> um, well, why don't you continue with, uh, you know... Oh, your... well, eventually I got picked up, was taken up to Division Head, 1st Division Headquarters, which I'm thinking that was Hill 55. I'm not real sure of that, but... Uh, uh, you know, I spent maybe a week for, a, you know, an introduction uh, to tanks thing there with the battalion headquarters and got my platoon assigned to me and went off probably to Sea Anchor, which was near Marble Mountain first, and, you know, began work as a second lieutenant in a tank battalion, a tank platoon. And how long were you in the tank platoon before they signed? They were pulled out uh, be because the, the war was winding down and they were taking units out at that point. The 3rd Division had already left Vietnam at that point. <clears throat> so they pulled out all but one platoon and they kept an experienced lieutenant for that one. And uh, they, the rest of the platoon or the rest of the battalion went back to Camp Pendleton. But as was done then, people were near enough to rotation date went with the unit those like me who had only been there three months were reassigned so uh, that was in near the end of march i think that uh, and sadly enough coming back from anwa there there were somehow we ended up with another platoon tank platoon there um and i don't know if they pulled them in from someplace else or maybe there might have been two it was a big base and they might have had two tank platoons there but there were two of us tank officers in our platoons or a half of mine in my case coming back from there and uh, you know it was quite a convoy we were escorting a lot of trucks and everything bringing other people and gear and stuff out of there uh, and my tank began overheating so I notified the other lieutenant I'd been in the on the point of the thing that you know I was going to pull over and you know let my tank cool down and, you know, his unit passed and took the lead on it. And it wasn't long after that, you know, I saw a big cloud of black smoke up ahead rising up in the sky. So, you know, we hurried up there with the other half of the convoy. He had struck what they estimated had been a buried 250-pound bomb, and it had blown the tread right off of both sides of the tank. It hadn't pierced the tank. The structural integrity held, but... Uh, well, everybody in the tank, you know, was, was completely shocked from the concussion and everything. And unfortunately, they had had a guy who had been our radio man uh, was sitting on the outside of the tank. He was riding, leaning up against the front of the turret, and he was blown off the tank, landed in, on the road in front of the tank on his back, and the tank skidded up on him right up to his waist, you know, because there were no wheels or tread left on the front end and there were some engineers nearby with a, a big 
truck with a you know a lift on it and they stripped all the gears out of that thing and they couldn't lift it either so I don't know how long he was there a couple hours before they were able to get a tank uh, you know uh, repair it was like a tank with a big hook on it that could it was made designed for towing tanks and they could lift that up and get him out of there so um, he actually was part of the other guy's platoon he went to see him at the the temporary hospital there in Da Nang and he lost both legs up to the waist. He was 19. Did, were there many casualties in your unit? No, that was the only one. Uh, you know, that area was, I think, Viet Cong, not in VA, and it was small unit tactics, ambushes, booby traps, that sort of stuff, and I don't think they ever had the firepower in one place to attack. You know, we had never went one tank at a time. There were always at least two, um, and always with supporting infantry and all. So, you know, you needed a lot of firepower to attack something like that, and they never did. And none of the compounds ever that I was with ever had a direct attack on them other than that one mortar instance. Um, things were pretty peaceful. Now, my other half of the tank battalion, you know, they got mortared or rocketed at different times there, but again, they never got a direct attack either, so uh, we had no casualties. I don't think there were any casualties in the 1st Tank Battalion uh, during the time, I, the three months or so I was there, other than, you know, that one poor guy. Uh, so in March, the, the, uh, the tank unit went home. Right. And... <laughs> Well, there's a story, too. It's funny now, but at the time it wasn't. But um, myself and a different tank lieutenant than the other one I was talking about were at, at, uh, we were at Anwa, and we got the notice that the tanks were being pulled out. But it wasn't the same lieutenant. I, I don't remember the circumstances. Maybe those two lieutenants traded positions or something. But this guy was really gung-ho. And by that time, the gung ho ness was wearing off on me. Uh, so, you know, the two of us, we got notified that we were going to lose our tank platoons and that we could be reassigned any place in the Westpac Command, Western Pacific. So we could have gone to Okinawa. We could have gone to division headquarters, you know, whatever we wanted. So we were discussing it. We decided to go down to the old club there to discuss it further. And, you know, after many, many beers, you know, that my gung ho has returned, thanks to this guy, and we got back on the radio, we got back to our unit, and got a hold of our, our platoon commander and told him that we wanted 03, which was infantry, and I think they told us to make three choices, and we told them our choices were 03, 03, and 03. <laughs> so the next morning I woke up with a pounding headache, and a dim recollection of something about 03. So I immediately tried to get a hold of my platoon commander, or my company commander, again, and got him. And before I could say anything, he said, oh, he says, I was just going to get a hold of you. He says, I ran into the commanding general at breakfast this morning, and he said, I told him I had two lieutenants who told me that all they wanted was 03 and nothing else. And the general said, well, then give it to them. <laughs> So you know, too late to change that. So I ended up, of all places, back at 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, which was the, the infantry unit at, at Sea Anchor that I had served with with my tanks. <clears throat> and that place was Booby Trap City. You know, and they kept sending patrols out there, and every night, you know, it seemed like somebody would get blown up, lose a leg, or get killed, or whatever. So I figured, oh boy, I've really done it to myself now. But they discovered that I had two years of law school, um, and their legal officer, who was a lieutenant from Darien, I don't remember his name now, but he had gotten uh, hit by mortar fragments two nights before and was medevaced out. He recovered. He wasn't that badly injured. But uh, he, I guess he was close enough to his rotation date. He wasn't coming back. So they said, well, you know, they'll make me a legal officer and also supply officer. So I, I was more than happy <laughs> to accept those two assignments. The other guy 
that talked me into doing that came there about a week after me and he did get a platoon he was he was gung-ho permanently i was only gung-ho at that point if i'd had like six beers but uh, so he got a platoon and he went out and while they were setting up an ambush out there one night suddenly rockets started going off near them so a Viet Cong group had set up rockets to shoot at the uh, division headquarters or no probably the Da Nang air base because we were just south of that um, so he took his squad and charged over there blazing away scared all of them off but then he was ordered to stay there for the night and protect the rockets you know so that the Viet Cong couldn't come back and shoot them so he said it was a long night wondering if they would come back but they never did so he got a silver star for that and he managed to get through the thing with you know he i know he he left for home before i did and he was a hundred percent there and i don't think he had any injury i don't think anybody in his uh, platoon but i know he told me that at different places they, some of his guys refused to take point so he said you know he had to take the point to show them that you know he was the leader so he said he did it you know he wondered if every step he took would be his last but fortunately for him he went home in one big piece so you know his name no i don't remember any of those names now I it's understand. yeah it's been 40 years <clears throat> so you spent uh how many months in, as a legal officer um, well that would have been probably early April that I got that assignment and I stayed there until October I think mid-October or so um, when uh, we'd gotten a new commanding officer that I didn't really like and he and I were loggerheads over a number of issues so um, I made inquiries at Division Legal to see if I could get a job up there and get transferred out of there. And I'm sure they must have. I realize now that they probably called them and said, hey, you've got a lieutenant there who's not terribly loyal and looking for a transfer out of there. Next thing I knew, I had a transfer to Okinawa. So I went from uh, abruptly, you know, they just told me, pack your gear, you're being transferred to the 3rd Shore Party Battalion on Okinawa. So, uh, and I went there by ship. Uh, I took all the stuff to, uh, to, to Da Nang, to some Navy ship there. It was an LSD, a brand new one. And, but a typhoon had just passed by there. And uh, the ship was definitely rocking and rolling all the way over there. Um, I, I was sort of seasick, but enough that I could eat and function. But... When we got on there, it was all bits and pieces of people from different units. There was no unit or anything on there. So some major discovered he was the highest ranking Marine officer there. So the rest of us were all looking forward to a nice, easy cruise, you know, from the privates right up to the lieutenants and captains. And this guy had decided he was going to take charge. And, you know, he assigned, he built a rank structure there. And we were divided up into units, and I was responsible for so many enlisted men whose quarters were way down deep in the hole where if you got seasick you didn't want to be so the only good thing about it was the ship left in the middle of the night and i woke up in the morning you know with the ship we were well we were out of sight of land at that point and that thing was rocking and rolling waves were crashing over the front of it and uh, so i immediately went up to deck to you know get some fresh air and look at the horizon to settle my stomach and uh, discovered that this major had turned solid green, a color which he remained for the whole trip. So we quickly realized, well, hey, you know, we were supposed to be out here for calisthenics or whatever. He's not showing up. So the whole thing just fell apart. <laughs> yeah, everybody just did their own thing for the, the I think it was a three-day trip to get there or whatever. Who did you say you were assigned to? The oh, I went to the 3rd Shore Party Battalion, which had just come back a couple months before from uh, Vietnam, where they'd been, I don't know, like six years or something like that. And they, there was a major there who was a temporary major, although he, was, he had a permanent commission, but 
he'd just gotten some kind of a promotion to major, but he wasn't a permanent major. And I guess he'd been told, you know, this command will make or break your future because if you don't make permanent major, you have to resign your commission or you'll be dismissed. So uh, it was real important to him. So my job for the whole three months was to sign stacks and stacks of records. That's all I did every day for three months. I would come in, my desk would be piled three feet high with stacks of record books and things. And, you know, I started out signing John W. Bates, which is the way I usually sign things. And quickly I developed a one line, J.W. Bates, J.W. Bates, you know, to sign those things. And after a while, it just became a squiggly line. <laughs> But my name was stamped underneath it so they could tell who it was. So that's all I did. And they were working to, you know, get all the records up to date, get the inventory correct. And they were going to stand an inspector general's inspection, I don't know, like two or three days after I was due to rotate. So, you know, I was something less <laughs> concerned about the whole thing at that time. But that's what I did pretty much was I have no idea what those things were. Some of them were personnel records. Some of them were inventory records. You know, I, I just signed everything without looking at it. Uh, so did the, the major. He had a co-sign, most of them, too. So that was what I did. And, you know, it was just before Christmas, so it allowed me to do all, all my Christmas shopping there while I was on Okinawa. I rented a car and drove all over the place and looking at different things there. Uh, and then, you know, my time was up. You wrote to get back to the States then? Yeah, that was by plane. I, I think we went to Kadena Air Base and flew out of there. It flew north to Japan, landed to refuel, and then it, we came into Travis Air Force Base, and we had to be transported down to, uh, it's a Navy base, it's out on an island out there, and I can't, a Treasure Island it was called, and that's where we were checked back in and put on leave and then we flew, I, I flew all the way back to New York and arrived home after what seemed like a week of you know, travel because you know it, it seemed like you'd look out the window it'd be daytime, you'd look out the window it'd be nighttime and because I get air sick I would take Dramamine so it made me sleep a lot of the time so I was never sure what day it was or whatever but I got home just before Christmas of uh, 1970. <coughs> and then what was your next uh, your next stop well I took a month's leave and uh, I was assigned to headquarters Marine Corps I didn't know what I was going to do until I got there and uh, because I was not a you know not a career officer and, and by that time if they said to me you know we'll make you a civilian I'd have been happy to accept but uh, they put me in a unit that responded to mostly to congressional inquiries. Uh, what typically would happen, some guy would be at Paris Island and he'd write home to his mother that the DI punched him in the stomach or something. And the mother would be outraged by this and would write to her congressman. And the congressman staff person would put a buck slip on it and send it over to headquarters Marine Corps and it would find its way down here. And we had a, <clears throat> a file of these things and typically we'd work on like a half a dozen at a time when you needed a new case you went to the file cabinet and you took the next one in line but we had civilians doing this too and they would always riffle through them and take easy ones so all those military we had one captain and I think there were four lieutenants uh, working in there plus maybe four civilians and you would read your letter see what it was about uh, if it needed to be researched, for example, if it was a Paris Island thing, <clears throat> you would call somebody in, in the Paris Island structure who responded to that. But it was funny because, you know, you'd call up and you'd say, this is, by the time it was the first lieutenant, this is First Lieutenant Bates from Headquarters Marine Corps. Headquarters Marine Corps? Oh, yes, sir, what can I do for you? And this is a captain or a major. You're talking about, well, yeah, yes, sir, I'm First Lieutenant. Oh, yes, sir, I heard that. Headquarters Marine Corps, what can I do for you? So I tell him, well, I need this checked out or that checked Yes, sir, we'll get right to that, you know. One time I actually had to call some general out in uh, in Japan, 
and uh, because of the, the time difference there, I, it was the middle of the night when I called over there, and his aide didn't want to wake him up. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm calling from headquarters Marine Corps, and that was a letter that would, would be signed by the commandant. And I said, I'm preparing a, a response to this letter for the commandant's signature. Oh, the commandant's signature! You know, the next thing I know, I was talking to a very groggy general. Oh, yes, sir, well, what can I do for you? Yeah. Uh, well, the commandant wants me to find out about this, that. Actually, I never met the commandant, but, you know, I found using his name seemed to make things go smoother. Oh, I don't know anything about that, but, you know, I'll have somebody on it right now, you know. So somebody went in. Of course, they would call back and then be the middle of the night the next day. We had answering machines on our end. So I'd get the message off of that and respond. But... Um, after after I worked there for like a month, I mean, I had been to law school for two years. I'm a pretty good writer, if I say so myself. So uh, a select group of us could prepare responses for the commandant, and I quickly joined that group, even though I didn't want to. Uh, but those had to be, you know, you had to have the, the letter, proposed letter on top, and then you had to have all the backup documentation all tabbed and everything. It was a a big deal just to put the package together, even though we had secretaries who did the typing and all. Uh, and then the lieutenant colonel that I worked for would take it across the street and it would be reviewed by the commandant staff people. They might make changes and he'd bring it back and I'd make the changes. And when he finally signed off on it, you know, you were done with it. But they were major productions, like producing a term paper or something. And at the same time, you'd be juggling a couple of routine ones that some were signed by the lieutenant colonel I worked for. You know, it depended on how important the congressman was. Uh, you know, like the ones that were from the, uh, one of the chairmen of the, uh, the defense uh, committee, those would be signed by the commandant. Uh, a lesser person, somebody who was just a member of it, then there'd be some general over there, and, you know, so on down the line until uh, you know, it, it was just somebody who'd just been elected to Congress and House of Representatives, and nobody had ever heard of them. That'd be signed by the lieutenant colonel I worked for. And you did that until the end of your... Uh, yeah, I did that for a year. And, uh, so you were in for a total of three? Three years, three months, and one day. I used to know the minutes and hours, too, but I've forgotten that. And then when I got home, uh, because I was going to go back to law school and finish up that one year that I had to do, uh, I stayed in the active reserves, and I was uh, the nearest reserve unit uh, to New Haven, which is where I was going to law school, was uh, a truck unit, and I don't remember what the official name of it was, but it was a transportation company, I think. You know, the reserves are all broken up and were spread all over, and I think it was a truck company that I was with, but of course officers don't drive trucks, so you know, we didn't really have much to do but schedule the meetings and occasionally do some sort of a training thing or something. And, you know, there was a, uh, there were two infantry reserve units. One was in Hartford, and I think that's now moved out to Plainville. And then there was another one. I don't remember where the second one was. Maybe it was in Massachusetts. But if they were going to run some kind of an operation, we would supply trucks for them for transportation. So I never went out on any of those. Usually it was all just enlisted men. You know, depending on how many trucks, you'd send a staff sergeant or a gunnery sergeant. But then they all liked doing it because, you know, even if it was a tactical situation, trucks are never really tactical. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, it was basically an overnight camping trip for them. They'd bring plenty of food and stuff, you know, watch the grunts running around, you know, living in the mud or whatever. So I did that for a year, and I got my veterans' benefits. And I think at the time the VA benefit was like a hundred dollars or hundred and ten dollars a month. And I, as I recall, my uh, reserve pay—you got two days' pay for one day's work, if I remember. And you typically, you worked one weekend a month, so you know, it was four days' pay. And I think that came to about the same. Maybe it was a hundred and twenty-five or something like that, but. You know, it doesn't seem like much now, but $220 or whatever it was a month back in 1972 uh, and three was a fairly decent chunk of change. Uh, 
and I had saved a lot of money from when I was overseas. Uh, so, you know, I got my last year of law school done, and I stayed in the reserves, I think, for a few months beyond that. But that one, it, it always seemed to me if it rained three weekends out of the month, the one sunny month would be the one with the reserve meeting. So uh, I quickly got tired of that, stayed in the active reserve, in active reserves rather for maybe another two or three years till I got a letter from the Marine Corps saying either go active again or, you know, submit your resignation. So I submitted my resignation and that was it. Were you, were you married when you went to Vietnam? No, no. I didn't get married until I was up here. I should should say in there, uh, first of all, even though my name is John W. Bates, I've always been known as Jack because my father was also John. So we could tell who my mother was yelling at. As we used to joke, although my mother never really yelled much. But uh, I was born and raised in Norwalk, Connecticut, graduated from high school, Brian McMahon High School there, went to Bethany College in Bethany, West Virginia, and then went on to Yale Law School after that. Um, so that's my uh, track record there before the Marine Corps. And then after the Marine Corps, I worked briefly as a lawyer. And just as I didn't like law school, I don't know why I was surprised, but I didn't like being a lawyer either. So I was casting about for something else to do. And I took a job with the state as a grant administrator working with criminal justice grants, federal state uh, money. And I did that for the next 25 and a half years and retired. Um, did, did you feel that you suffered from any uh, post-traumatic? No, because I wasn't in heavy combat. You know, I mean, that, the most stressful thing was <laughs> that one mortar incident, but that only lasted five minutes, and they didn't get anybody. I mean, they chopped up some comm wire and stuff. That was about it. So, uh, you know, it was not a stressful situation to me. And not being a career officer, I mean, they couldn't really make it stressful for me. Um, so if I got leaned on by a, you know, a senior officer and I had some there, you know, I probably was a little too uppity for my own good. But, you know, because I wasn't career, you know, I wasn't going to kowtow towards the senior officials the way they expected people to. So, uh, so you know, there wasn't much they could do if they didn't like something I was doing. Oh, well, hey, make me a civilian then. I don't care. So, uh, you know, they, so it's hard to put pressure on somebody under those circumstances. So, no, I'm, I didn't have any ill effects from it. <clears throat> how, how did you stay in touch with your family? Did, uh, uh, letters for the most part. And I have those someplace. My mother, at least the ones I sent to my mother, she saved them for me. And I think they're up in my attic someplace. But... Uh, because this is the fourth place I've lived since I got out of Marine Corps. I had a lot of pictures from Vietnam and all. I haven't seen those. I've lived here for 28 years and I think it's been all of that since I've seen them. But I did run into that. I, I know they're up in the attic because I stumbled across them a couple of years ago. I think I looked at one or two and then put them back. Uh, is there anything... Did you... Uh, I know one other question. Did you... Uh join any veterans organization? Or no, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I've found over the years I, I'm not a good organizational person. I, I really don't, uh, didn't want to get into any of those organizations. And uh, I, I've had a, probably a funny attitude towards military stuff. I've never been, even though I've been to D.C., you know, because I worked with federal grant funds, I was down there quite often. Never went to the Vietnam Memorial. You know, I never read any of the books that came out on Vietnam or saw any of the movies or anything, except for Apocalypse. It was Apocalypse Now. My then wife dragged me to it, much to my regret. I said to her, this bears no relation to reality whatsoever. But, you know, it, to her it was entertainment. But uh, And the reason for that is, the one thing that I really feel bad about, I mean, 55,000 guys lost their life serving in this thing. And for what? You know, at the end, it wasn't the military who lost it. I mean, we could have kept going. It, it was this, the civilians. I mean, the country turned its back on it. 
the politicians just kind of were looking for some way to save a little face and escape from the thing. I mean, we lost the war. And, you know, it bothers me that 55,000 guys lost their lives, countless others maimed, uh, and for, for nothing, really, in my... Even if we won the war, you know, I don't know what anybody would have wanted with that country that had no oil. I mean, <laughs> they really had a big labor supply, as Nike found out afterwards. But, uh, you know, it just, it, when I think of it, it just saddens me to the point I don't want to see the Vietnam Memorial. I don't want to read about it. This is really the only thing I've done in the way of talking about it. Somewhere I read in a history that... Uh, before we really got into it, when the French had been beaten and the country, Vietnam was kind of muddling around in civil uh, strife there, that uh, John Foster Dulles, who was then Secretary of State, was at some meeting or whatever, and a high North Vietnamese official, in fact, I think it's the one that eventually worked with Henry Kissinger and, and you know, came up with the peace treaty there, but that he started to approach uh, John Foster Dulles with the idea of, you know, trying to make contact with the U.S. They really didn't want a war with the U.S. and probably would have welcomed, because it turned out, I mean, we were in there because we thought it was the domino thing, you know, China's going to take this country over. Well, lo and behold, the Vietnamese and the Chinese never were very friendly and still aren't to this day. And they weren't terribly thrilled with the Russians either. They would rather partner with the U.S. probably, if they could have. But Dulles turned his back on him and strode off, making it clear that you know he considered him to be an enemy and wasn't going to have any discussion with him. So, you know, I think to myself, gee, if if only he sat down and talked to the guy for a while, you know, maybe they could have avoided this whole thing. And, of course, a lot of Vietnamese were killed and maimed or whatever. Uh, and in the end, the North Vietnamese really control the country now to this day. I mean, it, it's run by the North. They're a different ethnic group. It's Annamese in the South and something else in the North. And that Northern group really has, has retained control of the country uh, to this day. But, uh, you know, it, it, it just... I'm terribly saddened to think of all that carnage and then we just turn our back and that's what it bothers me about Iraq and Afghanistan too I really see the same thing coming you know Obama took a uneasy one here when uh, the Iraqis refused to, to give uh, immunity to American servicemen serving there gave them the perfect out well if you're not going to do that then we're out of here so that was his excuse for pulling out. And I kind of think that whole thing, I mean, it's, it's going to fall into some kind of a, you know, probably a radical Muslim uh, group will end up running it. And the same thing, you know, Afghanistan, they're just shoveling sand against the tide. And I'm, I think that the Taliban will come back there, although this time they may decide not to let al-Qaeda in there because uh, apparently they blame al-Qaeda for getting them dragged into this to begin with. Um, so, you know, maybe there'll be some good out of it, but I doubt it. Did you, were you harassed at all when you got back by any of the any war? No. We had to travel in uniform, of course, to get the military rate. So when I flew from, and I must have looked a mess because I, I don't know how long it was. I remember shaving in at Travis Air Force Base. Uh, cut myself several times, you know, in a bathroom there in the airport, <coughs> and then flew home, and, you know, same uniform, never got a chance to change or anything, so, uh, but I didn't care, I was heading in the right direction, <laughs> but, uh, no, I didn't see anybody, uh, but, of course, I think when I was in California, most of that was at night, I landed at Travis, went to Treasure Island, and then went to San Francisco airport. I think that was like all night time. And when I landed in New York, you know, I hopped on one of those shuttles and zipped on home. So I didn't see anybody. Nobody came up to me and said, thanks for your service or anything like that either. But uh, anything you'd like to add as a, as a wrap up? 
No, I can't think of it. I think we've pretty well covered everything. I did want to get in that part about you know, not wanting to uh, have anything to do with like the Vietnam Memorial or any of those things. And I know for some people they're a real touchstone, but uh, I just think that, you know, I, I, I don't look for sadness. If I can avoid it, I do. And I see no reason to go there and inflict any more sadness because I think that's the reaction I would have to it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sure. And thank you for your service. Oh, no.